three, two, one, started. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim Lamondia, and I'm the chief scientist at the Windsor Valley Laboratory, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce today's speaker to you. Dr. Jatinder Olak earned his PhD in weed science at Auburn University in 2013, winning awards as outstanding graduate student. He accepted a postdoctoral appointment at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, investigating herbicide-resistant weeds, and joined the CAS Valley Lab in August of 2015. He currently conducts weed management research on a wide range of crops, including Christmas trees, nursery crops, vegetables, and landscapes, as well as management of invasive weeds. Jutinder works directly with growers to solve weed problems, conducts and publishes research to advance the science of weed science, and has a strong outreach program with growers and citizens. He recently discovered Palmer amaranth as a new weed in Connecticut and is investigating herbicide resistance. He will tell us about that in his seminar today entitled Evolution and Mechanisms of Herbicide Resistance in Weeds, a Palmer Amaranth Case Study. Thank you, Jim. So let's have a quick uh, look at the presentation offline. I will start with the basics. What is the difference uh, between herbicide tolerance and herbicide resistance? Uh, then how resistance evolves? And then I'll discuss the resistance mechanism, especially in relation to glyphosate. So today I'll be covering only glyphosate resistance mechanism in Palmer Ramblin. And finally, I'll present results from Connecticut um, resistance research that I conducted this year on Palmer and then that we found last year. So first is herbicide tolerance. It's the inherent ability of a species to survive and reproduce following herbicide treatment. So uh, in simple word, herbicide never control a plant or weed species. And there are some weeds like Asiatic day flower, and field bind weed, which are naturally tolerant to glyphosate. Uh, so you can dump gallons of uh, glyphosate an acre and you will not see any acceptable control of these plants. Uh, then a lot of our crops are also naturally tolerant to many herbicides. For example, our grasses and our grassy crops like corn, wheat, uh, they are naturally tolerant to herbicides like uh, clopidar and 2,4-D, dicamba. These are synthetic growth regulators. And our broadleaf crops like cotton, peanut, soybean, they are naturally tolerant to graminicides. Uh, so the graminicides are the herbicides which control only grasses. And examples are like uh, herbicides such as clepidin and cefoxidum. So herbicide resistance is inherent ability of a plant. So in case of herbicide tolerance, it was inherent ability of a whole plant species. But in, in herbicide resistance, it's an individual plant that survived and reproduced following exposure to a dose of herbicide, which was previously effective in controlling the sensitive population. So a herbicide used to control a weed in the past, but it's no more effective. There are many herbicide resistant weeds, so um, I'm citing two examples of glyphosate resistant uh, horseweed and glyphosate resistant palmer uh, Previously, and still the sensitive biotypes you can control with the pint and half of glyphosate, but there are some resistant biotypes which you cannot control even with the three, four gallons or even more of glyphosate per acre. Uh, herbicide resistance is not a new phenomenon. Um, it's been, it's, it dates back to 1950s when our first uh, uh, herbicide resistant weed was discovered. It was 240 resistant wild carrot uh, from Canada in 1957. And you can see the first herbicide was commercialized in 1942. It was 240. So within 15 years, we uh, uh, we had our first weed showing resistance to herbicide. And then there was 2,4-D resistant field bind weed uh, from Kansas in 1964. And then another weed, common ground cell, became resistant to simazine in 1972. 
So chronological increase in herbicide resistance weeds globally. So we've seen that uh, until 1972, there were only very few weeds which were resistant to herbicides. There was a sudden increase in herbicide resistance after 1980. So you can see there was a linear increase because by this time, a lot of herbicide chemistries have been commercialized. And uh, so we uh, saw resistance to herbicides like photosynthesis inhibitors, uh, like atrazine, and then there was ALS resistant weeds, ACCA's inhibitor resistant weeds. Um, so currently there are over 500 resistant weed species around the globe. So how resistance evolves um, um, in uh, very simple words, we can say um, herbicide resistance is the consequence of uh, um, uh, misuse of a technology or herbicide. So uh, when uh, we are making repeated application of uh, herbicide from single site of action uh, over and over again over a um, vast acreage, then uh, we are imposing a selection pressure. So as a result, uh, uh, we are selecting some resistant individuals which are already present in the majority sensitive population. So, so I would say it is, uh, it is a consequence of an oversimplified approach to the weed management. So, um, so survival of the fittest, uh, this holds very true to the herbicide resistance because the uh, individuals which are capable or able to um, overcome a herbicide treatment in a population, they survive and they multiply. Uh, yeah. So this is, uh, um, a population, uh, you know, uh, what we can um, see at the beginning, even before we start making a herbicide application. So, so you can see uh, herbicide resistant individuals are present at very low frequency in the uh, original population. So when we are making a herbicide application, herbicide kills the sensitive individuals. And so, uh, you can see something like this uh, in first, uh, very first or second year. You can see some weeds which are escaping control. They can be scattered um, everywhere in a big field or they can be in patches. So those uh, surviving individuals, they will reproduce, they will produce seed. And uh, by the time uh, of next application, you will see uh, their numbers are increasing. So you will see a mix of herbicide resistant and sensitive weeds. Uh, and with another herbicide application, um, you will kill the sensitive plants and maybe second or third year, you will see more resistant individuals. And at this time, resistance is very visible. So gradually, um, when we continue making application of the same herbicide or herbicide from same mode of action, we are slowly replacing the sensitive population by the resistant population. And finally, we will see whole population is replaced by these uh, resistant uh, individuals. And eventually you will have a field looking like this, I would say this is an eyesore. So, so herbicide resistance mechanisms, uh, before we uh, talk about resistance mechanism, is a brief introduction about Palmer Amaranth. Palmer Amaranth is known by many common names like Palmer Pigweed, KLS Pigweed. Um, it is a member of Amaranth AC family. Which, is, which consists of uh, 174 genera and over 2,500 plant species. Palmer amaranth is native to Sonoran deserts of southwestern United States uh, and northwestern Mexico. Um, 
over the last uh, four decades it has moved north as far north uh, as in north dakota and uh, minnesota and uh, far northeast uh, in massachusetts and uh, connecticut so this is uh, uh, very new to connecticut and it was confirmed last year uh, in 2019 so currently a uh, farmer emerald is uh, present in uh, 41 states in the U.S. and uh, Connecticut is the 41st state to uh, confirm its presence. Palmer amaranth is an uh, economically important weed. Uh, in a recent weed survey by Weed Science Society of America, uh, Palmer amaranth was rated as the most troublesome weed in several agronomic and horticultural crops and uh, it's been found to have a potential for 100% yield loss in many of these crops. So Palmer amaranth uh, has several weedy characteristics uh, which make it a uh, formidable weed and the most important characteristics uh, of Palmer amaranth is its ability to rapidly acquire resistance to herbicides Currently in the United States, Palmer amaranth is resistant to eight different uh, to herbicides from eight different modes of action. It is resistant to ALS inhibitors. It's resistant to EPSPS inhibitor, which include glyphosate. Uh, it's resistant to HPPD inhibitors, uh, long chain fatty acid inhibitors, microtubule inhibitors, uh, PPO inhibitors, and PS2, these are photosynthesis inhibitors and synthetic oxygen inhibitors. So it is resistant now to eight different modes of action. Uh, even uh, I would say still worse is uh, uh, that we have uh, Palmer amaranth populations in some states which are resistant to more than uh, to resistant to uh, more than uh, two herbicide. Uh, from different modes of action. So in states like Kansas, um, Missouri, and Nebraska, there are Palmer amaranth biotypes which are resistant to ALS, PS2, HPPD, EPSPS, and synthetic oxygen inhibitors. And in Arkansas, there's a biotype which is resistant to uh, ALS, PS2, PPO, EPSPS, and microcubal inhibitors. So this makes the uh, management of Palmer and uh, very challenging. So before we go into the herbicide resistance mechanism, let's have a quick look at uh, glyphosate as a herbicide and uh, glyphosate based resistance uh, 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 crop, uh, glyphosate based crop technologies or around the predicate crop technology. So the herbicidal properties of glyphosate were discovered first in 1970s and uh, it was commercialized first in 1974. Um, initially it was considered as uh, one in a century herbicide because of its uh, uh, attributes like uh, non-selective weed control. Glyphosate can provide control of uh, many broadleaf weeds, grasses, and sedges that include both annual and perennial weeds. So it can provide more than uh, 200 weed species. Um, glyphosate also has uh, the safest environment uh, and human uh, health uh, profile compared to all the all other herbicides so far. And uh, it has low soil residual activity, which allows for flexible crop rotation. So after making glyphosate application, you can plant any crop within um, within a few weeks, typically two weeks after application. Uh, glyphosate initially was intended for use in non-crop areas or as a pre-plant burn down treatments in the agricultural crops or uh, as a director application for total vegetation management in perennial crops. Its use in agronomic crops increased with the uh, introduction of uh, Roundup 
or glyphosate resistant gene in our crops. So the first crop which had glyphosate uh, resistance was soybean and it was commercialized in 1996 and it was then followed by several other crops. So as a result of uh, Roundup Ready technology, uh, farmers uh, had in the, uh, it was first time in the history of weed management, farmers had uh, uh, perfect weed control and they had a squeaky clean uh, corn, soybean, uh, corn, cotton and soybean fields. But the Roundup Ready technology also uh, allowed for multiple uh, applications of glyphosate. So farmers were on an average making three to five application within a, within a season. So it, it was a misuse of glyphosate because they were relying only on glyphosate and they stopped using other weed management tactics and they were also not using any pre uh, a pre emergent herbicide. So the weed management became oversimplified and as a result of this, there was a, a huge selection pressure imposed by glyphosate for selection of uh, herbicide resistant weeds. So soon what happened, the weeds started developing resistance to glyphosate the first wheat to develop resistance to glyphosate was the rigid rye grass. This was not from around the Prairie uh, crop and system. It was reported from a walnut orchard in uh, California. The first wheat that evolved resistance to glyphosate in around the Prairie crop and system was horse wheat uh, from Delaware and was followed by common rag, common rag wheat in 2004 and then Palmer Rembrandt and water hemp. So currently uh, there are 51 weed species around the world which have evolved resistance to glyphosate and in the United States there are 17 weed species which are resistant to glyphosate. So how glyphosate works? Um, so glyphosate kills the sensitive plant by blocking the synthesis of aromatic amino acids which include uh, amino acid like phenylalanine, pen tryptophan, and tyrosine. So to do this, glyphosate uh, binds with the EPSPS enzyme. So EPSPS enzyme is the site of action of glyphosate. So by binding with this enzyme, glyphosate blocks the conversion of Shikimate 3 phosphate to 5 eno pyrrole Shikimate 3 phosphate, which is precursor for synthesis of the aromatic amino acids. So, glyphosate resistant mechanisms in Palmer amaranth. Um, so, uh, Palmer amaranth has evolved glyphosate resistance um, via both target site mechanisms and non-target site based mechanisms. In the target site, um, it could be altered target site or gene amplification, enhanced gene expression. The non-target site mechanisms include um, uh, reduced absorption, reduced translocation, sequestration and enhanced metabolism are also the non-target site based, but these have not been uh, reported in Palmer angles yet. So uh, in the alter target site, um, so this lock and key model uh, is I think uh, is the simplest way to describe uh, what happens when the target site is mutated. So in a sensitive plant, um, you can see the herbicide will fit into the target molecule and then it will prevent the synthesis of uh, aromatic amino acids which are uh, vital for the survival of plant. So in the absence of those amino acid plant dies, but uh, when target site mutate herbicide no longer uh, binds with the target molecule which is EPSPS in case of glyphosate. So there are some conformational changes in the uh, target site enzyme, which 
uh, make binding of the herbicide uh, uh, impossible. Uh, so as a result, um, the EPSPS enzyme is available to carry on the conversion of uh, shikimate 3 phosphate into 5-enol pyruvyl shikimate 3 phosphate and amino acid production continue when plant survives. And this is what happens in the existing plant. So the uh, most common target site uh, mutation uh, in Palmer Ambient is uh, a substitution at position 106 of the EPSPS gene, uh, which results in uh, uh, substitution of a single nucle nucleotide, which uh, 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 initially used to uh, uh, code for proline. So this is the proline to saline substitution at 106. And um, in some cases, uh, there is also a proline to alanine or proline to leucine or threonine substitution. Um, so most common is a single nucleotide uh, substitution, but uh, some uh, substitutions at 102 and 103 position of EPSPS gene has also been reported in some polymer amaranth biotypes. So the target site based, uh, uh, the alter target site based uh, herbicide or glyphosate resistance uh, uh, endows plant with the ability to uh, tolerate two to three fold more uh, glyphosate level than the uh, labeled rates. So in the uh, gene amplification, uh, resistant plants have uh, multiple copies of EPSPS genes. In this case, the enzyme is still sensitive. It binds with the glyphosate, but there is uh, over production of EPSPS enzyme because there are more copies of the gene. So in this uh, slide, you can see the figure A is a sensitive plant where there is a single copy of EPSPS gene on uh, only one chromosome. And then you can see um, the EPSPS enzyme binds with the glyphosate, but there is still uh, sufficient glyphosate to block the amino acid production, uh, aromatic amino acid production. But in the resistant plant, EPSPS gene is present at multiple locations on a chromosome. And in Palmer Amaranth, uh, they have found that uh, um, EPSPS gene copy was present on all the chromosomes in the Palmer Amaranth. So in this case, there is overproduction of enzyme so the normal rates of glyphosate uh, are not sufficient to, um, to, to stop uh, the amino acid production. So you can see there is still uh, extra EPSPS enzyme after uh, locking the normal um, glyphosate levels. So up to 160 copies of EPSPS genes have been discovered in some Palmer Amaranth biotypes from Nebraska. So this is the primary uh, mechanism of herbicide resistance in, uh, in Palmer Amaranth, uh, glyphosate resistance in Palmer Amaranth. Uh, and this provides very high level of resistance. And you can see uh, Palmer Amaranth biotypes which can tolerate uh, more than 100 times the labor rates of uh, glyphosate. Then it enhanced gene expression. Um, till date, there is no evidence of uh, overproduction of EPSPS enzyme without gene amplification. Uh, so it's very similar to uh, the previous slide, but the only difference is uh, that uh, uh, in this case, there is no change in the uh, gene copy number. So there is still the same uh, gene copy number between sensitive and resistant individual, but uh, uh, the EPSPS gene in the resistant individual 
produces more EPSPS enzyme. It's not been reported in Palmer Emerald, but uh, in Kansas, there was a Porsche biotype which uh, had higher EPSPS levels without um, difference in gene copy number compared to the um, compared to the sensitive plants. Then non-target site uh, resistance, first is reduced absorption. So in this case, uh, glyphosate doesn't uh, enter the cell or cytoplasm in sufficient quantities. So this can be due to the presence of um, apicuticular waxes or presence of hairs uh, on the leaf surface. Um, it's not very widely reported. Uh, there is, I think there is uh, maybe one or two reports of uh, Palmer amaranth uh, resistance to glyphosate as a result of reduced absorption. Reduced translocation, again in this case, herbicide doesn't move sufficiently to the target site. Um, it's not been, uh, again, um, uh, I think there is only one case where it was both reduced absorption and redu re reduced translocation, which was uh, the mechanism for uh, glyphosate resistance. But uh, with respect to reduced translocation, there was a, a unique phenomenon in giant ragweed, which is called, which is called pheno uh, Phoenix phenomenon. So what happens in this is the treated leaves they uh, rapidly desiccate and then uh, all the glyphosate which was applied on those leaves is trapped and then the leaf shed and it's not translocated. So you can see uh, in the top uh, A and B A is a sensitive um, giant ragweed two days after glyphosate application and then B is a uh, a sensitive giant ragweed 21 day after application. C is a glyphosate resistant individual two day after a glyphosate application. So you can see uh, the older leaves that contacted herbicide, they were desiccating and then 21 day after application, there was a healthy uh, giant, rag, giant ragweed. So this is the mechanism of uh, um, um, resistance in one of the giant ragweed biotypes, which is non target side yeast. So I could find only one paper on Palmer amaranth, which reported a reduced absorption and uh, reduced translocation as a mechanism, mechanism of glyphosate resistance. And this is from uh, Argentina. And then is enhanced metabolism. So in enhanced metabolism, glyphosate is rapidly broken down into uh, non-toxic metabolites such as uh, amino methylphosphonic acids, glyoxidates, formaldehyde, and sarcosine. Again, this is not reported in Palmer Amaranth, but it's been reported in uh, uh, Porsche biotype in Kansas. But uh, um, the metabolism based uh, herbicide resistance is uh, the uh, most, I would say, uh, notorious because uh, the metabolic resistance involves a very complex uh, enzyme system, the cytochrome P40, P450. And once a uh, weed become resistance to a herbicide metabolically, it has often been uh, you know, seen to uh, develop resistance to uh, other unrelated herbicides. So far, there is only uh, one uh, um, case of glyphosate resistance via metabolism and it's been discovered in um, barnyard grass from Australia. <clears throat> uh, vacuolar sequestration, in this case herbicide is 
sequestrated into the vacuoles. So there is not enough herbicide available to reach the target site. Again, this is uh, a mechanism still not discovered in case of Palmer Amaranth, but uh, it's been present in glyphosate resistant horseweed, uh, which was discovered in Tennessee. So you can see this uh, uh, non uh, this nuclear magnetic resonance image um, for sensitive horseweed. You can see there was more glyphosate in the cytoplasm. So you can see this higher peak is for cytoplasmic glyphosate content and a low peak for vacuolar glyphosate. Whereas in the resistant plant, more glyphosate was in the vacuole. So the resistant plants were able to sequestrate uh, most of the glyphosate and very little reach the, the cytoplasm of the plant of uh, the, uh, the site of action. So um, in glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth, um, mainly the um, resistance mechanism are target site based and um, of these um, the gene amplification is most widely reported mechanism, which is also um, associated with the high levels of resistance in Palmer uh, In the non-target site based mechanisms, majority of the resistance events are um, due to um, herbicide, reduced herbicide uh, absorption and translocation in the we still haven't found any metabolic resistance to glyphosate in Palmer Amaranth. So now I'm going to share results from our Connecticut uh, Palmer Amaranth resistance research uh, that I conducted this year. So the Palmer Amaranth in Connecticut was first reported in the fall of last year from pumpkin fields in East Windsor. Um, grant distribution, so we did some uh, survey of the pumpkin growers farms this year and we found that there were uh, approximately 300 acres. This is a very conservative estimate because we were not able to do a uh, very thorough uh, survey throughout the state. So this year we uh, tried to uh, folks more uh, in this area where we have uh, in the surrounding area where we found Palmer Amaranth last year. So this is a picture from Palmer Rambland field I took this year. Um, last year it was 10 times better and I also did some um, Palmer Rambland density sampling in this field and so we have found that there were on an average 2.4 female plants per square feet. This, uh, amount, this comes out to 104, uh, 104,000 female uh, Palmer Amaranth plant, per plant. So each Palmer Amaranth uh, can produce up to uh, 600, uh, thousand seeds, but for this I used uh, uh, an, uh, on an average uh, 200,000 seeds per, uh, per female plant. So it works out to 21 billion uh, Palmer Amaranth seeds per acre and this was a 10 acre field. So you can, uh, you can uh, see how many seeds are present in this uh, one field there. Uh, so, so this is a picture from the uh, pumpkin field. So I don't think anyone can see any pumpkin vines. So, so this is how it looks in uh, many forms we visited this year. So I collected some seeds uh, in in 2019, fall 2019, because uh, um, I because this was the first 
report of Palmer Emirates in Connecticut, and um, I was um, kind of uh, suspicious that if it is coming from uh, other state where it is already uh, resistant to herbicide, so I wanted to determine if it is resistant to glyphosate uh, and amazoquine uh, herbicide. So, um, so we tested um, uh, glyphosate and amazoquine up to 16 x rate. So one x rate of uh, glyphosate is 840 grams acid equivalent, which comes about, I think, uh, a quart of glyphosate per acre, and then for imazepine, uh, one x or labor rate was 137 gram uh, acid equivalent of uh, imazepine. So for each um, treatment, there were 160 plants because we had five to six runs of uh, these dosage stones bioassays, and for each run there were uh, at least 32 farmer animal plants. Uh, so for comparison purpose, I got a sensitive population, uh, glyphosate sensitive uh, farmer animal population from Kansas. Um, this is the, um, these are the results from glyphosate uh, dose response study. So, uh, in this figure, uh, you can see the red curve is for Kansas or sensitive biotype and black curve is for uh, CT biotype. And uh, as you can see, uh, the Kansas biotype was 90% control. So this is the visual control 21 day after the glyphosate application. So it took only 424 grams, which is less than the labor rate. So Kansas uh, biotype was uh, very sensitive, but for CT biotype, it took more than 4,000 uh, gram acid equivalent to uh, produce 90% control of polymer amylin. So this makes CT biotype tenfold resistant compared to the sensitive biotype from Kansas. So these are some pictures. So this is glyphosate 1X. So you can see, see these plants are looking very healthy. Then there is uh, in the uh, right top control on the left side and uh, uh, plants treated with the 2X glyphosate. And in the bottom is control versus 4X glyphosate. And then ALS and inter resistance. Um, so again, Kansas biotype is in red and CT biotype is in uh, black curve is for CT biotype. Again, visual control 21 day. Um, so what we saw that uh, even the Kansas biotype was resistant to ALS and inter resistance because typically it takes 137 gram of uh, imazequine per hectare to uh, provide uh, over 90% control of uh, a sensitive population. But uh, as you can see, even the Kansas biotype took 727 gram, which is pretty much like uh, five to six fold uh, more compared to the um, labor rate. But in the Connecticut biotype, we could barely see control more than 20%. So even at the um, uh, 16 X rate, which is uh, about uh, 2200 grams of acid equivalent control was below um, below 20%. So I assume resistant could be more than 100 folds uh, to ALS in, uh, inhibitor herbicide imazepine. So this is a picture of uh, Palmer Rembrandt. Uh, you can see control plant in the left. 
and then different rates of amazepine. Last is the 16x rate of amazepine. So um, we conclude. Uh, we can conclude that CT biotype is multiple herbicide resistant. So we have seen uh, control failure with the recommended rate of both glyphosate and mazepin. So far, mazepin resistance is more than 16 fold. And uh, we have seen that it was also resistant to other ALS inhibitor herbicides. So this is called cross resistance. So when you have a population which is resistant to one herbicide and then if it is resistant to similar herbicide or herbicide sharing the same mode of action that's known as the cross resistance. Um, but uh, uh, we believe this is a, a metabolic based resistance to ALS herbicides because when we treated with the uh, marathion, we could reverse the resistance. So, um, so by marathion treatment, plants were controlled more than 80% uh, for the CT biotype. For glyphosate, um, we have seen it is more than, uh, it is 10x resistant uh, compared to the sensitive case biotype. Uh, I also uh, studied uh, atrazine response in this population uh, using 2x rate, which is pretty much close to 2000 um, gram of atrazine per hectare, and we have seen 45% survival. So this uh, indicates there could be uh, atrazine resistance in this population as well. That is what we need to study uh, in the coming years. Uh, I also tested CT bar of CT farmer amaranth biotype response to other herbicide to see what are the uh, uh, effective herbicide options to control this population. So you can see um, uh, carfentazone ethyl glufosinate. Uh, lactofen and oxyflofen were the uh, most effective herbicide that provided 100% control of CT biotype 21 day after uh, herbicide treatment. We had as 2,4-D clopidrolid and uh, dicamba, mesotrion. They had uh, a control in the range of 75 to 82%. So we saw a similar uh, trend in the uh, farmer animal biomass reduction, which was harvested 21 day after treatment. So this is the dry biomass. So for cross resistance, you can see the chlorimuran ethyl, halosulfuran methyl, and sulfometuran methyl. These are the other ALS uh, inhibitor herbicide that we um, applied on palmer rampant, but you can see there was no control by these herbicides. So this shows uh, our CT biotype is cross resistance to other ALS in herbicides as well. So in the future, um, um, I'm interested in um, understanding what, what are the underlying mechanism for glyphosate and ALS resistance in in Palmer and uh, which uh, which is now present in Connecticut, um, and we also want to confirm its uh, um, um, response to other herbicides like atrazine uh, in those response studies uh, and asmatolachlor and pandemethrin because. Uh, as we have seen in previous slide, Palmer Amaranth in the United States is resistant to these uh, different herbicide mode of action. So uh, this is going to be our, uh, uh, a component of our future dose response studies um, that we will be doing uh, hopefully next year.
So um, I uh, have updated uh, information on uh, this website, International Herbicide Resistant Weed Database. And uh, uh, now um, if you visit this website, you can see uh, Palmer Amaranth is listed as a herbicide or multiple herbicide resistant weed in Connecticut. So this is the website which uh, maintain all the record of herbicide resistance uh, events in in the world. Um, I have um, just finished uh, a manuscript and uh, it was submitted to weed technology and um, it has come back with the very minor um, 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 revision. So hopefully, um, I think it will be published by um, March next year because that's the I think the time when they're gonna have their next issue of uh, um, weed technology. So, so this has been I would say um, what's been published. And with this, I think that's all about uh, Palmer Rampant. And if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. Thanks, Jutinder. Um, actually, there are a couple of questions that have been uh, posted at the chat. First one is, is herbicide resistance inevitable? Oh, okay. herbicide resistance inevitable. Um, I don't think it is because um, currently we do not have um, any new herbicide mode of action to which uh, uh, weeds have not evolved resistance. So even if I think we are, we have some herbicide chemistries which are not targeting a single enzyme or uh, metabolic or any other physiological function in plant, the thing again is if we're going to be imposing selection pressure using i don't know like right now palmer amnath is resistant to so many different herbicides so any new chemical um i i doubt we're gonna have anything which can be prone uh, which can be uh with, which will not be susceptible to herbicide resistance. So I think it's an evolutionary process. It will happen even, I would say, despite uh, despite diversifying our uh, uh, weed management approach. Um, I think uh, we can we can play, but we can we cannot prevent. Next question is, would adaptive degradation of an herbicide by local soil microbes due to selective enrichment be considered a form of herbicide resistance? Uh, adaptive, uh, can you, uh, Jim, can you please repeat the question? Oh, sure. Adaptive degradation, meaning the microbes are breaking the herbicides down. Um, so would that be a form of resistance or, or what do you consider that? Um, Form of resistance. I don't uh, think it is. Uh, um, will I, I know it, just, yeah, just an example for me. Uh, there are some um, nematicides that were actually broken down more fairly quickly by some of the soil microbes. Now I don't necessarily think of that as resistance, but just a lot loss of efficacy. But, yeah. So yeah. I think that could be a basis of, uh, you know, uh, if you know the mechanism, maybe you can use that mechanism to uh, introduce a, a resistance trait in the plant, like uh, how they did for this glyphosate herbicide because it was broken down by and they found the gene responsible for uh, that, uh, you know, the glyphosate degradation. Um, but it's not, it's uh, as you said, it's it could be a loss of efficacy. But again, you know, depends on if it is a soil applied herbicide, 
then we can say it's a loss of efficacy, but if it is a foliar applied and absorbed, then I don't know how much uh, um, uh, you know it will have effect in on herbicide efficacy because yeah. Might actually be a good thing. It'd break down residues in the soil. Um, yeah. OK, next question is um, uh, very nice job. There's an in inter increasing interest in using nanotechnology to manage crop disease. Applying nanotechnology as a weed control or herbicidal approach is an area where there's been very little work. Can you describe some of the work that um, you're starting to plan in this area? Uh, yes, yeah. So this year, um, um, actually, we had a student uh, who is interested in uh, um, in studying the effect of nanoparticles in improving herbicide efficacy. So we're going to have uh, some experiments using this uh, our Connecticut Palmer Ambulance Biotype. And uh, currently we are uh, uh, working on what herbicides we're going to be using. So, um, so I think this will be a uh, this is a new um, uh, area and there is very little information. So if we can see the nanoparticles can improve the herbicide efficacy or uh, even from the um, non-target site based resistance, you know, uh, 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 point of view, if uh, the nanoparticles can, uh, you know, help uh, 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 stop in the uh, metabolism of glyphosate or, uh, or prevent its sequestration in, in, in uh, vacuoles, it can maybe improve, uh, you know, the or uh, safeguard glyphosate efficacy against the uh, against those non non target site based mechanisms. So uh, we are uh, looking forward to, you know, this research and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, um, uh, great results to share from these studies. Okay, next question is, are there non-chemical options for control of Palmer amaranth, such as biological or cultural controls? Uh, there are some options where we are making integrated use of cover crops and, um, um, but again, you know, um, uh, a lot of those approaches are not very practical because even when you are doing cover crops, you can suppress Palmer amaranth germination even up to 90 percent. Uh, but uh, if you look at the biology of this weed, even um, if there is 99 percent control of uh, Palmer amaranth, it is not uh, considered as acceptable control. So if you can have something that can provide 100 percent control, that is what would work out best because if there is only few plants who survive uh, chemical or non-chemical uh, control, next year you're going to have a, um, you know, maybe you will end up going to the same uh, uh, same situation you were a year or uh, more before. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, the deep uh, tillage can help bury Palmer amaranth seed uh, and prevents its uh, um, emergence, but uh, none of those methods have provided um, more than 85-90% control. Still, you have to rely on some herbicide, uh, pre-emergent herbicide and even some uh, residual herbicide later in the season at the uh, lay-by. Uh, uh, lay by treatment. So I don't think there is a 100% control by the non chemical methods. Um, so you gotta be using herbicides and other uh, approaches in an integrated way to um, to keep the uh, population low and even do some hand weeding to prevent uh, you know, the um, new seed entry into this soil. So I think it's going to be integrated management. Okay, 
uh, to follow up on that, I have a question actually in that um, in some of these grow crops, if growers are required to use multiple herbicides to get the kind of control they need, is that actually cost prohibitive or is this something that they can afford to do and still make a profit? Um, multiple herbicides, you know, um, I think uh, um, it will vary with the uh, crop also, herbicide cost also, but um, if anyone has a herbicide resistant weed on their field, then I think it will be economical in the long run to spend more bucks uh, upstream. Uh, otherwise, you know, if uh, one is relying on a few chemicals, I think uh, he'll be uh, persistently facing the same problem year after year. So, um, I think with addition of more herbicides, costs are going to be high, but uh, they are, uh, I think, uh, a practical way to go when when you are dealing with the resistant weed. Okay. Next question is, how does malathion synergize the ALS herbicides? What enzymes are put out of commission in plants by organophosphates? Uh, malathion, how does it synergize the herbicide? So um, what uh, we uh, what's reported about malathion is it's an uh, inhibitor of the cytochrome um, enzyme complex. So by inhibiting those cytochrome enzyme complex, it is uh, um, stopping the degradation of the herbicide or its metabolic decomposition. So that's the uh, main mechanism how the malathion reverses um, uh, the uh, metabolic resistance. Um, from a management standpoint, I don't think it is going to be a very effective solution because uh, uh, it is not 100% uh, successful in, in, in controlling uh, uh, metabolically resistant population. So we'll have to rely on something novel or uh, uh, new mode of action, I would say. If, if, uh, and again, you know, uh, it's not like uh, switching to one mode of action. Again, it's going to be um, Sometimes, you know, the tank mixing uh, different herbicides, herbicides especially from different mode of action is the uh, more sustainable approach. And what we've seen that if you are rotating herbicide, it won't mitigate the chances of herbicide re resistance. So the best way is using multiple modes of action at the same time. So. Okay, uh the, the last question here, it kind of, I think, must go along with the uh, the field where you couldn't see the pumpkins, but only Palmer amaranth. So is Palmer amaranth edible? <laughs> Can you eat the leaves? Palmer the amaranth, um, I think to some extent, maybe, but it will depend upon how much one is eating because uh, all pigweeds, they are known for their high nitrate content and uh, nitrates are not good for the heart. So I would say if somebody is eating in uh, uh, moderate quantities, but I don't know what uh, what is a what is a moderate quantity. I have never tried, but uh, I know there are some palmer and some amaranth like smooth amaranth. I have uh, I have uh, I I did consume it. Uh, I would say liberally in India, so without any effect. But I never made anything from Palmer and I don't know there was a, I think we had one uh, weed scientist at Auburn University he used to you know every time he was uh, introducing us to a new weed he will make something a dish and share with the student but I don't remember he ever brought anything made from Palmer and but I see some people have tried Okay, I think that's the last of the questions that I can see anyways.
All righty, thanks again. And, uh, if anybody has any question, you know, um, maybe they can email or, um, you know, whatever way or call, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Jitinder. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay.